Some of the birds were dunlin with curved bills and black bellies, or ready turnstones, piebald with patches of rust and black and white like an Italian harlequin. Not that I could see such details while they flew. It was all just a mass of motion and blurred shape and wings, now brown gray, now flashing white as thousands of racing birds flipped in instant eerie unison and wheeled about with their pale undersides showing. Little just, little sense of what it's like on the Yellow Sea when the when the shorebirds are moving through there in the springtime. Yeah, it's just fantastic. And I, I just, you know, your use of words is so vivid. I just want to ask a paragraph like that, how long does that take to write? Hmm. Um I don't know. It's kind of I, I'm tempted, I'm tempted to answer using an answer that my um my old friend and art mentor Ned Smith, who actually painted that on the wall back there, um, used to respond when people asked him how long it took him to, to paint a painting. He said, two weeks and a lifetime before that, um, uh, which, which sounds a little flip. But um, I, so, so some, some sections come easy, some, some easily, and some sections don't. I do a lot of rewriting. I do a lot of refining. I do a lot, lot of going back and flipping around and uh, but so so some, sometimes it just comes out you know kind of you know ready to go form sometimes I, I labor over it quite a bit so it's it's kind of it's kind of hard to say um, you know in in all I've been I was working on this book for about five and a half or six years um, pretty much full time for about the last two years or so with with the majority of the travel that I was doing from like the end of 2017 through the end of 2018. So like, you know, about a year and a half, two years of, of really intensive travel and doing a lot of, um, um, you know, doing a lot of, of uh, writing while I was doing that. Um, I see somebody actually just asked in the chat if I write poetry, N not good poetry, not poetry you'd ever want to see. Um, I've, I've tried my hand at it a couple of times and I am here to tell you I suck as a poet. Um, I will stick to prose, thank you very much. Well, your prose is poetry. <laughs> It's beautiful. Okay. And, and you, you know, I, I, you um, described one species as ghostly gray. And, you know, I looked, I looked up that bird to see if anybody else had ever used ghostly gray, and it had never been described as ghostly gray. It's oh. just, I think, fun for everyone to see birds described in such a different, maybe, you know, more beautiful way. Well, I mean, that's actually one of the fun things about about writing and every every you know, once in a while you'll, you'll come up I'll, you come up with a description that you're particularly fond of i was years ago i was down in argentina and there's lots of grassland tinnies out on the pampas of argentina and and they kind of they kind of scurry and, and skitter and and uh, you know across the road like they're trying to they're trying to avoid you and it and it's it struck me they looked like i said they looked like a, a spy in a trench coat trying to avoid notice um and you know, I don't know where the hell does that come from. I mean, why why you would think of a spy in a trench coat looking at a, a small bird in southern in southern Argentina? But I mean, occasionally one of those things will pop into your head, and it, it becomes a vivid image. So. Um, so you have a question in the box from Suzanne Sutcliffe, and and for all of you hmm. who are watching either on the live stream or those of you who are in the room with us, please put any of your questions in the box. And we always love it if you, in the chat box, and we always love it if you introduce yourself and tell us where you're logging in from. Um, but Suzanne asked, do you use field notes and photos to help you recall the scenes that you see? I, I do. I take a lot of notes in real time in the field in longhand. I don't write in longhand. I, I, if you took my, my laptop away from me, I'd be rendered mute. But I, I do, I, I, do a lot of note taking in the field. It's very ex extemporaneous. I'll usually keep two notebooks, one just for, for random observations, and I number the pages because I can never find anything otherwise, and date a lot of stuff. And then I often have another notebook that I use for, uh, for interviews. And I'm not a very good record keeper, note taker most of the time, but I also, when I'm, when I'm traveling, um, I, I will also try to journal while I'm out there, you know, kind of sum things up at the end of the day. And just for me, a, a lot of it is trying to get as much down in, in real time when it's very fresh as possible. Um, you know, certainly I take, a, I take a ton of pictures, um, you know, sometimes shoot a little bit of video, although for the most part, it's still photography and that certainly helps, but there's nothing, nothing quite as getting the impressions down when when they're fresh because if you wait even five minutes they're gone the problem is when you're doing that 
you know, in the in the field, walking, talking, bouncing in cars. There there have been more than a few times where I had some brilliant idea and I was utterly incapable of deciphering my handwriting afterwards. I have there's you know there's gems that that vanished because my chicken scrawl was was indecipherable. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so does that mean that you're writing just notes down as you're as you're thinking about it or seeing it, or are you actually starting to kind of formulate the paragraphs? Sometimes, sometimes things will pop into your head. You'll, you'll realize, um, you know, that there's a narrative framework that that um, suddenly becomes clear to you, and, and you try to sketch that out. For the most part, I'm just trying to um, I'm trying to record impressions and thoughts, and dis especially descriptive things, because the you know the best time to describe something is when you're actually looking at it. Um, although, again, you know, sitting down at the end of the day and trying to sum things up also gives you the opportunity to put things in perspective. Um, so, you know, those you get those those varying varying degrees of of, um, of perspective that come through. Great, and uh, this is great because I'm I'm not getting any of my questions in. So, thank you, Diana. It's good to see you back. Um, Diana Biggs writes: You wrote about Polaris being important among other things for birds to orient. What do they use in the Southern Hemisphere? You know, that's a really good question. And I think that the fact that I can't give you a precise answer to that speaks to the Northern Hemisphere bias of the science of ornithology, where most of the people doing this research are in, or, you know, have traditionally been in North America or Europe, working with Northern Hemisphere birds. You know, you got, you know, Steve Emlin back in the 1960s taking song sparrows and putting them in, an Emlin funnel, a little wire cage with a, a cone of um, blotter paper and, uh, and an ink pad for a perch and putting it in a planetarium showing the northern sky at night and realizing that the bird was orienting around whatever part of the sky was not rotating around Polaris. Um, I would imagine, in the, and this is a guess because I, I have to confess I don't really know here, um, that one of the cues that they're using in terms of celestial orientation is the the part of the sky that rotates less than other parts of the sky, but I don't really know. But the good thing is birds have, you know, all kinds of other fallbacks. They can use magnetic orientation and they can use the position and movement of the sun across the sky and polarized light across the sky. And if they're seabirds, they can smell their way back home and they can hear extremely low, low frequency infrasound, which travels thousands of miles generated by like tectonic plate movement and volcanic, volcanic, volcanic activity and winds. Um, so there's, you know, they've got a whole, they've got a whole suite of, of orientation cues that they can, that they can fall back on. But, you know, Diana, I got to look that one up. I'm gonna have to find out. All right, we'll save that for the next book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the organization of the book. You start in China, you end in India. Uh, how did you, and then it's mostly in the middle of the Americas. How did you decide on that order? Um, well, the, the ending in India was, was, a, was a gimme because it was, you know, look, I mean, the state of migration today is worrisome. I mean, a lot of us who've been spending a, a long time working on migratory bird conservation have a lot to worry about. And I knew that some of the news that I was going to be discussing was going to be pretty grim. And so I wanted to go out in a high note because the, uh, the situation in India with the migration of Amur falcons through Nagaland is one of the most extraordinary conservation success stories, rapid conservation success stories that I've ever had the opportunity to report on. And I started in China because I thought that was going to be the most depressing part. You know, when I, when I planned my trip to China in the spring of 2018, in the, in the year or so leading up to it, when I was in contact with conservationists and, and researchers in China and elsewhere around the world that are working in China, the assumption was that, you know, the, the 11 to 13 million shorebirds that depend on the Yellow Sea every year were, were heading for, you know, in many cases, heading for extinction because the, the Chinese and Koreans, uh, particularly the South Koreans, seemed hellbent on destroying the 40 or so percent of the Yellow Sea mudflats that hadn't already been walled off and, and, uh, and, and turned into dry land. And then just a couple of months before I got there in May of 2018, the Chinese government did this astonishing thing, which was they, they did what totalitarian governments can sometimes do, which is, you know, make a decision whether or not anybody likes it. And they banned all further coastal 
um, development on the on the Chinese side of the Yellow Sea. Um, it was it was a staggeringly important win for conservation. And when I got over there, the the conservationists that I was spending time with, people like Jing Li from um, the small nonprofit called Spoonbill Sandpiper in China, and Dr. Tunis Piersma from the Netherlands, who's you know without question, the most important and respected shorebird scientist in the world. He's actually got a subspecies of red knot named after him, which we were watching on the Yellow Sea, you know, Caligus canutus Um, But anyway, these folks were, you know, grappling with this completely unfamiliar emotion of hope. Um, Tunis told me that in the 10 or 12 years he'd been coming to the Yellow Sea, he, he said, I thought my job was to document the extinction of these birds, and there would be value in that. But he said, now I I hope I have enough life left that I can see their recovery. And since he's about my age, I, I hope I have enough life left too. Um, so, so I, you know, I thought I was going to be starting at a low point and building up to it, but it was actually nice to have a, a little shot of good news right off the bat there. Oh yeah. That was excellent news. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I'm going to go to Juanita's question and Juanita's asking about climate change and its, and its impacts on migration. Oh yeah, well let's let's cut right to the big enchilada here. I mean, this is this is the the single biggest challenge um, facing migratory birds right now. Um, every, everything else, I think, in the long term is going to is going to pale in, in in comparison to climate change. Um, you know, it, climate change is already affecting bird migration in, in many parts of the world. Um, it's it's changing migration timing. It's changing resources on which the birds depend. It is changing weather systems and wind patterns, which are, as you can imagine, um, of primary importance to migratory birds. You know, they need to, they need to have predictable weather patterns, predictable wind directions, and predictable wind speeds at certain times of the year, because they, many of them simply cannot complete their migrations if they don't have a wind assist. You know, think about Bartail Godwits flying 7,200 miles from Alaska to New Zealand. The only way they can do that, and you know, and it, takes them 11 days even with an assist is taking off from Alaska with 80 or 90 mile an hour gale force winds behind them and picking up you know prevailing winds at different points out in the Pacific Ocean to help them along um, you know if you start changing that these birds these birds are going to it's going to have an effect on the birds now I mean Cornell um, has been doing some some climate modeling that suggests that in North America at least at some times of the year, in some areas, the winds are actually going to become even more, are going to become more favorable for migratory birds. They will have they will have better and stronger tailwinds at certain times of the year. At other times of the year, the winds are going to become significantly less favorable. They'll have headwinds or, or really strong crosswinds that they're going to have to fight against. And of course, this is all based on on modeling. We don't know for sure what's going to happen. But um, you know the the models have been pretty good up to this point on on climate. If anything, they just underestimated um, where the situation is right now. The biggest, a couple of the, the biggest concerns that we that we have about migratory birds are seasonal disjuncts, seasonal disconnects, where the birds and the migration and the seasons get so far out of out of whack that the connections break. And um, we're seeing that in a couple of places right now. Um, one of the clearest examples of this is actually from Europe, where you have Palearctic migrants that, that breed in Europe and winter in sub-Saharan Africa, birds like pied flycatchers. Pied flycatchers are found across um, Western Central Europe and up into, into the UK. They breed in hardwood forests. They've got, a, they've got a really tough migration. They've got to fly first across the Sahara Desert and then across the Mediterranean Sea to get back in the springtime. But they have to time their migration, like most small birds, to get back set up a territory, find a mate, build a nest, lay their eggs, incubate those eggs, hatch the chicks out, and have the, have the chicks hatch just at the same time as the seasonal explosion of caterpillars in the hardwood forests of Europe are reaching their peak because most small birds feed their chicks caterpillars. Even birds like waxwings that normally feed on fruit or sparrows that feed a lot on, on seeds, they, feed, they have to feed their, their, kids, their chicks insects. And soft-bodied caterpillars are the go-to food for most temperate zone birds. Well, what's happened increasingly in Europe as spring is occurring earlier and earlier and earlier and earlier every year, 
the pied flycatchers are coming back on basically the same schedule they always have. You know, they're they're down in they're down in tropical Africa. They don't know what the weather is like up in Europe. So they're coming back when their internal circadian rhythm tells them to come back, when the changing photo period um, tells them to come back. And so they get every year, they get a little farther and a little farther and a little farther out of sync with the seasons. And what has happened in recent decades is they've gone so far out of sync with the seasons that by the time their chicks are hatched and are at their hungriest, the caterpillar peak has already passed. And consequently, in the UK, their population has dropped by more than 50% in the last 15, 20 years. And in parts of mainland Europe, like the Netherlands, they drop by about 90 or 95%. Now, we haven't seen that in, happening in North America with our neotropical migrants yet. Possibly because our migrants don't have quite as arduous a journey. You know, our, their wintering areas are much closer to the breeding grounds. You know, Southern Mexico, Northern Central America, the Greater Antilles, it's an easier flight for them. Um, but they are also, in, in the case of long distance migrants, coming back on average exactly when they did a century ago, and spring is getting earlier and earlier and earlier. So at some point, you know, that string may break to the stretch to the breaking point. What we're also seeing in parts of the Canadian Arctic, especially the Eastern and, and Central Canadian Arctic, there's like this weird climactic whiplash that's going on up there. You know, I don't like the I don't like the term global warming because it in, infers that everything's getting warm evenly everywhere, and it's not. It's like global weirding, and some places are getting colder at certain times of the year in addition to getting warmer, and that's what's happening in the eastern and central Canadian Arctic. Late winter and early spring are dramatically colder than than they were 15, 20 years ago, and summer is dramatically hotter. So birds like Hudsonian godwits that are coming back up from Chile and Argentina. Um, redneck phalaropes that are wintering off the western coast of South America, semi palm sandpipers that wintered in South America. They're flying back up through the center of America and they get back to the breeding grounds and everything's locked up in ice and snow much later than it normally would be. So they wait and they wait and they wait and finally they get to start breeding and then bam, the climate switch flips and it gets dramatically hotter. Well, these birds depend on insects as well for their chicks. Their chicks are precocial. They come out of the egg and have to feed themselves. They need to be able to time the, the hatching of their chicks with the emergence of midges and mosquitoes and other insects in the Arctic. Because it gets so hot so fast, the insects are actually coming out earlier than they used to. The birds are, are breeding later. By the time the chicks are at their hungriest, there's there's very little for them to eat. And what's happening with a lot of those birds, like Hudsonian godwits, many years are unable to bring off more than just five or 6% of their chicks successfully. That, that is calamitous for those birds. And we're seeing declines in those populations um, directly due to these changes in the climate up there. Wow, that was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry oh, but but very either. good and very thorough. And uh, I appreciate that. I think it's really helpful for people to understand some of these implications. I think we tend to think of these changes as our local changes. Oh, it's warmer earlier. I actually like that maybe, you know, but we don't think about the connections and what happens across the flyways. And it's, it's important to understand that. Um, I'm going to take it to a lighter tone, though, for just a moment and take a question from Montana. Please from uh, Dr. Bob Petty, who says, if raptors are the coolest order of birds, except for the Corvidae family, I'm including, <laughs> I'm including to agree with you. I may be inclined to agree with you. Do you have a favorite raptor species? Uh, asking to pick my favorite kid. Um, for 25 years, if Bob, and by the way, hi, Bob. Um, if Bob had asked me that question, I, I would have, un unhesitantly answered the northern sawwood owl. I've been studying northern sawwood owls for the last quarter century or so in Pennsylvania. My, my crew and I have banded about 12,000 of them. I get as giddy excited about every new sawwood owl I catch as I did the first one. But seven years ago, eight years ago, we started working with snowy owls through Project Snowstorm. And God almighty, that is a dramatic bird. Um, they're big and they're charismatic and they've got killer yellow eyes and they get the sense it's like you know it's like you're in the in the presence of a person you know they're just um that is just one sexy bird and um hmm, i gotta tell you pretty I'm, I'm 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 pretty i'm pretty hooked on snowy owls these days so but you know the fact is like most birders my favorite birds are the one i i'm looking at right right then um you know this just this morning 
our first hermit thrush showed up here at, at the house in New Hampshire with a band on its leg, one, of the, one, the, one that I banded here last summer. And that was a wonderful bird to see. Um, and once, once those hermit thrushes start singing, the, the, you know, filling the woods of New Hampshire with their song, that's pretty sweet too. Yep. Yep. Love it when all the robins start coming back here. <laughs> Just those flocks. Okay. Um, thanks. I'll see if he responds to that. Uh, so next question is about writing. And um, Alicia King, uh, who is currently living in Alaska, asks about her daughter, Kathleen, who is 24 and doing a lot of communications. Oh I God. know, right? Kathleen <laughs> is 24? Alicia, we're old. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, we all know each other. <laughs> so... Um, what, um, you know, for people who are thinking about writing for whether it's blogs or magazines or a book, uh, you know, how did you get yourself to, uh, you, I mean, you, you went and got your degree in it, but. Um, no, 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 no. Wait mm -hmm. a minute. I am mm -hmm. a college dropout. I do not have an academic degree. The only de well, okay. degrees <laughs> I have are, are honorary doctorates. Oh, that's great. So, I want to so, do it that way. So, so, this is, so here's the thing. I, you know. <laughs> I am not the I am not the person you invite to career day. I mean, my career path <laughs> could at, at 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 the politest be described as circuitous. Um, I was I you know I wanted to get a biology degree and become a herpetologist, and then discovered they expected me to do mathematics for a, a biology degree. So I bailed on that and became an art major so I could become a wildlife artist. But it turns out I'm not very good at that, and I dropped out of college in my junior year, having just taken an ornithology course. Thank God, and wound up writing a weekly natural history column for our local newspaper more or less by accident because I had I, I, um, I said so, I was complaining to a, a, a friend of mine who had at one time written for that newspaper about how the local paper didn't have a nature column. He said, well, don't complain about it. Get in the car. I'll take you up and introduce you to the editor. I was 19. Why I thought I had anything worth saying at 19, I don't know. But they hired me to do this weekly natural history column for which I could draw a little pen and ink illustration. That was kind of like the, you know, the art, I was still trying to be a wildlife artist. That was the, the impetus there. And I discovered completely by accident that I liked to write. And that led to a full-time reporting job a couple of years later at that paper. I was there for eight or nine years, ended up doing investigative reporting. It was one of the best small family-owned newspapers in the country. It had just won the Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. It was a great place to learn how to write. But Sue, I have no training as a writer. I have no training as a scientist. It is, it has been, I've been, I've been working without a net for a long time here. Um, but you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about ornithology is it is a, it is a field of science that has always been unusually welcoming of passionate outsiders um, and passionate, passionate amateurs. And, you know, in the last yeah, and that's actually part of the story of, of this new book is, you know, over the last 20, 25 years, I've gotten more and more deeply involved in actually doing the field research, not just, not just observing birds from the outside, but, you know, working with Carol McIntyre and Ian Stenhouse in Denali National Park with the National Park Service, studying the migration of birds up in Denali and, um, you know, founding Project Snowstorm seven or eight years ago with 25 or 30 other colleagues, you know, Banders researchers, wildlife veterinarians, wildlife pathologists studying snowy owl migration. Um, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been, to, you know, working right now to try to build out the modus wildlife tracking system across uh, the Northeast to, to, to try to make it possible to track even the smallest migrants. It's been, been a lot of fun, but um, <laughs> my, you know, it's, it's, it's not because I've got initials after my name, that's, that's for sure. Man, well, went, you don't have to worry about one, Kathleen. <laughs> no, no, that's great. You don't have to worry about Kathleen. She has her college degree all, yes. all, all packaged up there. So, um, so that I didn't answer. I did, did not at all answer Alicia's question on that. Um, so the, the best, you know, the best thing for Kathleen to do, Alicia, would be to, would be to network. And I would say her mother can help her quite a bit with that. Um, <laughs> Probably. You know, it really is. I mean, it's, that's that's a big part. That's really a big part of it, frankly. And um, you know, get into um, you know, get into the field as much as possible if she's interested in in the kind of the kind of writing that uh, I, it looks like she like she is. So again, you've got you got some good connections there. Good advice. 
So now we now we have oh you have a lot more questions coming in. Um, so uh, there was a follow up to Diana's question about Polaris and about the Southern Hemisphere, and there was a question which you may not be able to answer because we already uh, we already discussed it. But there was a comment that could it possibly be the Southern Cross. And then have you been given the opportunity to consult with the Biden administration? Mm. No, not, I'm, I'm really upset. Neither Joe nor Kamala have, have called me. Um, I've, um, I'm waiting. I've been waiting for it. I'm, the phone is on. Um, so no, actually, joking aside, no, I, I have not. I have generally stayed away from politics. But um, Interesting, back, just to circle back on the, on the Southern Cross, I suspect probably not because birds don't use the pattern of the stars overhead. They're, they're not paying attention to that. What, what we know in the Northern Hemisphere they're looking at is the, the area about 30 degrees around Polaris that, that moves where the stars appear to move or move very little. So any particular arrangement of stars in the Southern Hemisphere um, most likely would not be uh, an orientation cue for them. But, but I am I'm very curious to look into that a little bit more and I'm you know and it shows it shows this northern hemisphere bias that that uh, ornithology in general and apparently me in particular also has huh. okay that's interesting um let's see let me make sure not, oh so um Juanita was asking oh was it Juanita was asking about your just your personal activities and do you do you do bird feeding or do you have a certain garden that you use to attract birds where you live? Um, yes and yes. I, 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 I feed, I feed um, have feeders out, seed feeders and suet feeders out in the winter time. We can't really do that um, here in, in the North Woods in the summertime or we end up feeding the bears, which is you know, not, not a good thing. Um, I, I do have some hummingbird feeders up in the summertime. We moved to New Hampshire um, in almost almost exactly two years ago, and the place we bought it's kind of tucked back in the woods, and it had this big square of grass behind the house and nothing else. And so I used my pandemic lockdown time last year to do some major um, native plant gardening. I think I put about 500 plus native shrubs and perennials in last year. Um, tomorrow I'm going to the state nursery and picking up a couple hundred more native dogwoods, native viburnums, um, winterberry, all kinds of good berry producing um, fruiting shrubs for, uh, for birds. Um, I do, almost all of my gardening is with native plants. I've been doing that for about 30 years. Um, when, we, when we sold our house in Pennsylvania, I'd been gardening there for 30 years and it was killing me to, to move away from that. But fortunately, my nephew bought the place and so, it's, it's in it's in good hands there and he's, he's keeping it for birds so yeah I mean that's a um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how the bird diversity here at the house changes right now we've got a ton of woodland birds mostly up in the treetops and um, not a lot of kind of mid-level uh, um, birds and so I'm going to be planting a lot more shrubs here and yeah I can't I can't wait can't wait so it's not quite spring in New Hampshire yet it snowed again today but it's coming on fast same here in Colorado. Well, do you have a yard list? I do. Yeah. And it's um, not particularly impressive. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, I've actually, I, I'll be, I will be perfectly honest. I've been surprised and a little disappointed at how, how meager it has been. And I think it's because there's, there's no ecotone here. It is, it is either grass and we're, I'm a eliminating as much of that grass as I possibly can as quickly as I can. And then, you know, closed canopy, mature hemlock beech forest um, without a whole lot of, um, it's kind of middle-aged forest without a whole lot of, of structure to it. So I'm going to try to get a little bit more habitat diversity here. But hey, I mean, I've got Blackburnian warblers and um, Swainson's thrushes and blue-headed vireos um, that, that awaken us every morning. So I'm really not complaining. Yesterday, there was yeah. a juvenile female goshawk for about 45 minutes sitting right outside my window. I'm like, where uh, were you all winter long when you could have picked off the gray squirrels that were monopolizing my <laughs> computers? Well, well, hey, you've got people asking where in New Hampshire you are. So answer that question carefully, or you might find like okay. 40 some odd people at your doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of these and some of these people on here I know are odd. Um, <laughs> we are we are in Milton, New Hampshire, which is about 40 minutes north of Portsmouth, about 20 minutes south of Lake Winnipesaukee, about an hour south of the White Mountains, and about six miles as the raven flies from the main border. 
um, it's a it's a very nice it's a very nice place to live. It's a very we're kind of we're like 150 yards off a dirt road, my kind of place. Well, and Diana writes in again, I must, and I'm sure we all agree, I'm astonished that you don't have a science background. The section you wrote about the birds, that birds may visualize Earth's magnetic field through a form of quantum mechanics is a beautiful piece of writing. I'm going to be quoting you from that section with students. So oh, your well, book is well, going to make it into much. the classroom. <laughs> thank you very much, Diana. I have to tell you a story about that. A couple of years ago, I was giving a lecture um, at, at, during which I was trying to give my, my very much layman's um, uh, explanation of quantum entanglement in the eye of a bird. And I prefaced it by saying, I am not a quantum physicist. And I gave this explanation. And, and then a gentleman in the front row put his hand up and, he, and I called him and he said, I am a quantum physicist. I thought, oh crap. And he said, and you got that pretty much bang on. So I thought, okay, I'm not changing the way I describe that ever again because I got it I got it right once and I'm just going to I'm just going to stick with that explanation. So but yeah, I mean that's <laughs> that is that is as 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 crazy as crazy science as science gets that the quantum entanglement stuff. That was a great description. Um I want to I wanted to talk about something because it it hit home for those of us who've been uh, doing this for a long time was was your multiple discussions of habitats that birds use and the recognition that while the nesting bird may use one habitat at one point in its lifetime, it or its young may use a completely different habitat. And I wondered if you could just speak to that with one or a couple of your examples that you used in the book. Sure. Well, I mean, and this, and this just speaks to the fact that science is an evolving process, you know, and I, in, in the book, I, I, I quote my mother, who is a wise person, who said once many years ago, she said, she on? she's not, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. so far as I know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see her on there. Um, but she, she said, you know what bothers me about scientists? Scientists always say, we used to think, but now we know. And of course, you know, if a scientist is being honest, they should say, we used to think, and now we think. Now the preponderance of evidence suggests this, but we're open to you know new evidence that that causes us to upend all of our preconceptions. Except that's not human nature. And the way that's worked with with migratory birds is that, you know, particularly with with forest nesting songbirds, especially eastern forest nesting songbirds like scarlet tanagers and, and, and wood thrushes, that you know that we 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 began to understand and recognize in the 1980s and 90s how important. Um, a problem forced fragmentation was for a lot of these birds. And as you break these forests up into smaller and smaller pieces, it allows edge predators to come into the forest. It allows brown-headed cowbirds to come into the forest. Nesting success drops. So we thought, okay, here's how we here's how we protect these birds. Here's how we save them. We 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 prevent forest fragmentation. We create you know and 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 protect large intact blocks of forest. And scientists that were studying the nesting success of those interior forest nesting songbirds, there's very clear evidence that, that um, the farther away from an edge, the better. Um, the problem was nobody was actually, they were, they were, they were you know, tracking the adult birds to and from the nest. They were following what was happening in the nest. They were seeing how many chicks fledged from the nest. But once the chicks left the nest, that was kind of it. You know, I, I think I said in the book that, that you know, they'd go back to their Go back to their offices and write up their their field notes and scratch their bug bites and because you know trying to track like four juvenile wood thrushes exploding in different directions out of the nest and being provisioned by parents and moving farther and farther away through the forest is a nightmare but when people finally started doing that also in part because we finally had radio transmitters small enough to put on newly fledged birds without really endangering them they discovered that yeah the the adults are nesting within these large intact interior forests but as soon as the chicks fledge they're moving them out of those forests and into early successional habitat into thicket habitat you know you don't associate with thrushes with thicket habitat but and you don't notice them when they're in there they're not singing it's the end of the breeding season people just simply overlook the fact that many of these forest interior nesting birds are moving their chicks into early successional habitat and of course the chicks don't fly very well they can't really move very far. So 
it now appears that that one of the reasons maybe that with Russia's have been doing as poorly as they have is that yes, okay, we've been we've been saving these big blocks of of, of um, interior forest, but then they can't get their chicks into the early successional habitat that's full of fruit and full of insects. As one scientist said to me, they're photosynthetic factories, they're juggernauts producing so much bird food that these birds need to get their chicks up to speed and up to weight and ready for their first migration. So, you know, big surprise here. Maybe what we need are forests that replicate the structural complexity of the original old growth forest systems that we had in the East and the Midwest and elsewhere in pre-settlement times, where yes, you had big blocks of, of old um, structurally complex forest with really old trees, but also light gaps where there's small thickets and old beaver meadows that are regenerated in places where wildfires went through. Um, this, this interdigitation of different, the different mosaic of different habitat types so that the birds can nest safely in a large block of forest, but then move out of that into a nearby thicket where their chicks can feed. And, and actually some of the birds that are nesting in thicket habitat like golden wing warblers are going the other way back into interior forests with their chicks. So they're kind of passing each other like ships in the night. Um, it's much, much more complex than we ever thought. And of course that's that should be the abiding lesson about anything in nature, anything in ecology, is it's always more complicated than we think it's going to be. We're always peeling the onion. We're always, we're always finding new layers of complexity under there. So, you know, we used to think that forced fragmentation was important, or preventing forced fragmentation was important. Now we think that preventing that, as well as also having, um, you know, enough early successional habitat, I'm sure 20 years from now, the paradigm might shift again based on new based on new evidence, but we have to be willing to embrace that uncertainty and we have to be willing to act on the best information that we have now, take kind of an adaptive management approach. You know, if, if new information comes in and shows that we've been doing something wrong or something we should be doing better, then we change. Um, you know, we can't get locked into, into dogma, basically. Yeah, and a, and a good information to know, especially as, you know, a lot of the push now is to plant trees, plant trees. I think there's a Yep. three million tree effort or, or something like that. I can't remember, but it's so much more complicated, as you said. Sure. I mean, what trees, where, what species, how are you going to plant them and what, you know, are you going to create monoculture blocks of fast growing junk trees that don't belong there? Or are you going to try to create forests? You're going to let the, you know, it, yeah, it's, um, you know, one of the big pushes right now in the East and Midwest is to generate more early successional habitat because we, we need it. I mean, thicket species like box turtles and Eastern towhees and New England cottontails, have, you know, prairie warblers have, have, have tumbled in numbers, but that's gonna run up against people who are going, whoa, wait a minute. You know, if you're cutting down older forest, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. We, we, want, we want as many big trees as possible to suck up carbon and mitigate climate change. So um, it's, that's gonna be an interesting conversation to have from a, from a conservation management perspective. So we have time for maybe two more questions. Um, I'll, I'll take, take you to one about uh, young birds leaving the nest. And Juanita says that it amazes her that parent birds leave before the young leave often, or some do, to navigate south on their own. Uh, do the young birds go to the same place in the winter as the parents? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, everybody's, you know, most lay people have this notion that mom and dad are leading the kids south on their first migration. And, you know, with, with waterfowl and with cranes, there is some inter intergenerational transmission of, you know, kind of a culture of migration that, you know, a particular flyways, particular stopover sites. Um, but yeah, for everything, for almost every other bird, it's, it's entirely genetic. And for the most part, the, the, the parents leave long before the, before the chicks do. Um, one of the things that we've, that we've been discovering about migratory birds in, recent years is the importance of what's called migratory connectivity, where specific breeding, air, breeding populations in the north, here in the northern hemisphere, have specific wintering areas in the south. And it can be very, very finely graded. Wood thrushes, again, are another good example of this, where, uh, for example, the wood thrushes that breed in the east and northeast are primarily wintering on the Honduras, in the highlands on the Honduras-Nicaragua border. Wood thrushes from the western part of the range in the Midwest are for the most part wintering farther north in Mexico. 
Um, wood thrushes from the southeast are wintering, if I'm remembering correctly, primarily in the Yucatan Peninsula. So for the most part, these regional populations, kids from kids from one regional population are going to go to the same place that their that their parents do. Now it's not going to be the same shade coffee finca in Nicaragua necessarily. They're not going to show up three weeks after mom and dad get there. And go, oh, well, I made it. <laughs> Here I am. Um, you know, it's going to be in the same the same general area. But then there are other species of birds that have very low migratory connectivity, where they just kind of spread out over. Um, a, a more dispersed area on their wintering grounds. But, you know, the, the degree of migratory connectivity can, can really be extraordinary. And one of the things that I talk about in the book that I just I still find almost unbelievable, uh, some of the uh, Swainson's thrushes that we were tagging in Denali National Park and, and Wrangell St. Elias National Park in, in, in Alaska, and we put these little um, pinpoint GPS data loggers on them. So they what they do is they they don't transmit anything. They just they just record data, and every so many days they turn on, get a GPS location, log it in their memory banks, go back to sleep again. And when the bird comes back the next year, you can get this you know point to point, very precise route of where these birds went. These birds took off from Alaska, flew eight thousand miles, you know across the across the Caribbean, down through northern South America, east of the Andes and all the way down to this very narrow elevational range in, um, on the Bolivia-Argentina border, about 20 kilometers wide, about 120 kilometers from north to south. And all six of the thrushes that we tagged in Alaska wintered in that very, very narrow little band. Two of them that had nested within a mile of each other in Denali wintered within 20 kilometers of each other ah. in Bolivia. I mean, that is extraordinary tight migratory connectivity. So, you, you know, from a conservation perspective, what happens to those forests in Bolivia and Argentina is going to have a profound impact on the population of birds breeding 8,000 miles away in protected national parkland in the middle of one of the biggest wilderness areas in North America. Mm -hmm. Incredible stories. And yeah, I know that's some amazing work done by a lot of people. And I know by Pete Mira and uh, the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center and now his work at Georgetown. Mm -hmm. um, there's a definite push here to get you into politics. Um, so people want to know if if you were uh, if you were approached to give advice on how to conserve birds to the administration, but a very serious question. So thanks for this question. If, um, if, if nominated, not run. If elected, I will not serve. Um, <laughs> but, so. So I, I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question, and I, and I will treat it. I'll treat it as seriously as it should be treated. Um, the there's a, there's a couple of things that I think we can do. You know, if we if we look at North America's birds, you know that three billion bird loss paper that Pete Mara and Ken Rosenberg and a bunch of others came out with two years ago in Science. Um, the group of birds in North America that are in the worst shape are grassland birds, and that's the group of birds we could do the most for the fastest if we put our minds to it. Um, you know, wetland birds and waterfowl were in really bad shape in the 1980s. You know, duck populations were cratering because of habitat loss and drought. And we as a society put a lot of time and energy and resources and political will into restoring and protecting and enhancing wetland habitat. And one of the, one of the lessons from that 3 billion birds paper was that you know, at a time when almost all other groups of birds were declining, waterfowl and wetland birds came surging back again. Their populations have rebounded dramatically in the last 40 or 50 years. We can do that with grassland birds, but it's going to take, it's going to take much stronger federal farm policy. Um, you know, too much land that should not be farmed is farmed. You know, we have the conservation um, reserve program, the conservation reserve enhancement program in the east that pays farmers to take marginal land out of cultivation and put it in, in conservation um, for, for birds and, and a lot of other things. But the penalties for taking that land out of CRP are not high enough to prevent farmers when commodity prices go up like they did a couple of years ago, yanking all that land out and putting in the plow and sticking it in, in corn and soybeans again. Um, you know, we... There, but we, that's one that we can do. And, um, you know, I'm not an expert on grassland bird conservation and grassland management, but, but that's, that's low hanging fruit. And we could make a huge difference for the birds that are in the worst shape 
in North America. And so that would be that would be one area where I would suggest that the administration could could put some focus and, and Congress as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and give a couple of shout outs here to Bird Conservancy, the Rockies, which focuses mm-hmm. a lot of its work on grassland bird species with partners in Mexico, as well as Forest Service International Programs, which has a large grassland conservation program. Mm-hmm. So um, a number of organizations are working towards that end. Thanks for that, Scott. Sure. We, we always like to end on a conservation focus. And um, I, for those of you who don't know, uh, Alicia put up a message on Facebook that Scott will be the keynote speaker at Copper River uh, Delta Shorebird Festival. Virtually, I won't be there in person, unfortunately. Right, but an opportunity for you to watch him again. And uh, tonight was great. I just wanna see if you have any closing words. Oh, um, God, not really. I mean, just it, it, this is, I, I'm sure everybody on this, on this call this evening does this anyway, but there's never been a time when birds needed ambassadors as badly as they do now. And there's never been a time when I think the, the, the moment was as ripe as it is now. You know, if there was one silver lining to the pandemic, it's that a lot of people got hooked on birds that never paid the slightest attention to them before. I mean, by every measure, web traffic at Cornell and, and magazines like Birdwatcher's Digest and National Audubon, and it's just through the roof. Um, binocular sales, um, you know, the binocular manufacturers can't make the, the things fast enough. Um, you know, local local Audubon clubs are getting bombarded with requests from people who want to go on bird walks now that people are getting vaccinated and getting out again. It's, it's, we, we need, as a, as, a, as a bird conservation community, as a birding community, we need to seize this moment. This is a once in a generation, maybe once in a, in a century opportunity to, um, to take people who have suddenly become aware of the natural world and, and, and lead them a little farther into it and turn them from, you know, bird curious to bird advocates because we need as many of them as we can get right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. We, I hope that everyone on this, this call and watching on Facebook uh, take that to heart. And I know you're already committed, but spread the word, take a neighbor, take a grandkid, kid, whatever you have, <laughs> and get them out there. Random, like, that, like Random strangers off the street. <laughs> random strangers on the streets like that 12-year-old Scott and right. whoever out there, else out there got hooked as a kid because of somebody who took them under their uh, literal or not literal wing. <laughs> <laughs> so Scott, thanks. This has been a, a true pleasure. Your, your book is magnificent. I want to urge you guys, if you haven't gotten it, we still have a few copies left. And Scott kindly sent us um, a little book label in here. So we put that in for you with his signature and um, we can send that right out to you. And thank Super. you. Well, Sue, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. So good. So good to see you. And I, I, I hope I, uh, I hope I get to see some of you guys again because it's been way too long. Yes, it has been. Everybody's clapping. So, um, <laughs> and you're getting lots of kudos here. Thank you. Love the newest book and earlier ones. You've done a, ter- a terrific job to inspire us. Thank you for hosting. This was amazing. Great information. Um, wonderful presentation. Look forward to reading it. Wonderful discussion. Inspired. Love your book. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, I see um, Vivian Fu from South, South Korea. Vivian, I think you did the animation about Spoonbilled Sandpipers. Oh, is Vivian on? I, yes, which I, oh, which Vivian, I, which thank I love. Oh, Vivian, thank you so much. What time yes, is that, it, Vivian? <laughs> God, yes. Hope, hopefully it's the, I hope it's early morning in South Korea. Thank you, Vivian, oh, it is thank morning. you for everything you've done for, for Spoonbilled Sandpipers. Yes. Wonderful. That's so nice. Probably our farthest away participant. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> wonderful. This means this means a great deal to me to see, to yeah. see so many familiar faces and new friends. So us too. Well, this is something that has gone, you know, we started it because of COVID and it just was so much fun that, you know, even after COVID's hopefully gone or, you know, we are under control, we look forward to continuing it. It's just been such a pleasure to meet all the authors and have the opportunity. I just thoroughly enjoyed it, as has everybody else. Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, speaking of COVID, I got my second shot yesterday, and it's starting to kick my butt a little bit here. So I'm going to say <laughs> good night. Um, it was wonderful seeing you all.
Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, hopefully we'll see, we see each other out in the field sometime with binoculars. Sounds great. Thank you, Scott. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much.